thank you very much for joining me for a, a, a presentation called Just One Reason. And I think it's fair to start by explaining why I've called it Just One Reason. And it goes back to just before the pandemic, about November or December of 2019. I'd suffered a particularly difficult 2019 in my business, and I was looking for ways to reinvigorate it uh, and, and build a much more successful 2020. Little, little did I know what was to come. Uh, but I, in doing that, I was on a business accelerator program, and that led me to start thinking about uh, different ideas that I could introduce into my business, one of which was a senior leaders retreat. And I've got a network which has a number of high achieving leaders in it. Uh, and I really I'm always connecting people. And I just thought maybe that's something that I can turn into something a little bit more powerful. Uh, by the way, Nikki and Sarah is absolutely fine if you don't want to join um the, by camera just remove the request that's fine i'll take questions through q a later anyway if you want to then then we can do that at the end so i came up with this idea of a senior leaders retreat and i started scoping out who i felt would be the right fit and then i started scoping out the steps i would take to sell this new idea to them and i sat down with my coach on the accelerator program and we went through it and he he looked at everything i'd planned out the whole process of getting people engaged. And he turned to me and he just said, have these people worked with you before? And I said, yes, they have. I said, do you think that they respect you and they like you and they trust you? And I said, well, I certainly hope so. He said, why are you creating a sales process for them? Just pick up the phone and ask. And so I did that. Now, I'm sure many of you have been in a similar position where you've got to pick up the phone and ask something that feels big to you and uh, I prevaricated and I put it off and I did everything that everyone would do but eventually I started making calls and unsurprisingly given the roles I got a host of voicemails and I left messages not expecting to hear back every single one of them replied and when I spoke to each of them every single one of them maybe bar one was very enthusiastic in their response and really interested. It really blew me away. I didn't have to put all these processes in. They straight away said, that sounds something I want to be part of. And one of those people was a board level director of a global multinational, an organization every one of you will be very familiar with. And she'd been a client of mine a number of years before when she'd worked with another organization and we'd stayed in touch. And she said, Andy, I'm in. And she said, I'm in, and there's just one reason, you. She said, I trust you. If you think this will work, then I want to be part of it. And those words really knocked me sideways, because I think we're all quite capable of underestimating how other people see us and, and playing down our abilities and our talents. And, and I'm equally capable of doing that as well, probably capable of overplaying them at times as well. But those words, just one reason and it's you, really resonated. I'm someone who's been talking about the importance of having strong relationships for years. And here it was playing out for me in my own business, my own career. And relationships, while I've been talking about them for over 20 years, they are more important now than they have ever been. We're, we're coming into different times. I just want to read something to you that's from the uh, Delegate Workbook for this conference. And it really goes to one of the key points I wanted to make. It says leaders are often defined by their successes. These successes cannot be achieved in isolation. They are only affected by engaging with others to understand and make connections which build skills and confidence, deliver authenticity, drive purpose, demonstrate values and passion, build awareness of strengths and self-imposed barriers that arise in leaders' work and interactions, aids their emotional intelligence to act effectively with individuals, teams, organizations, and ecosystems while being resilient in terms of challenge and change. As we emerge from the challenges of the past 15 months, it is recognized that the changed and changing world will require a new leadership paradigm. 
we require a new leadership paradigm, a new way of working. The whole theme is regenerative leadership. And at the core of regenerative leadership are the relationships that you've got. The workplaces that you, you see now, the workplaces that you're going back to, as we've seen in Timon's excellent presentation this morning, are going to change. So much is going to happen post-COVID-19. We've seen Timon shed the stats on how many people see they, that they'll be back in the office full time. We're going to have to adapt to new ways of working. Timon mentioned Generation Z. He talked about them being an activist generation. I recently interviewed a generational expert for my podcast, and he said that Generation Z are going to be different to anyone else. They have different expectations to everyone else. One of the things that really struck me that he said was that they want to be mentored, not managed. We have to adapt as leaders and find a new way of working, a way that's more collaborative, a way that's more supportive, a way that's more vulnerable, more willing to open up and have uh, conversations. In the introduction to the same delegate workbook for this event, Paul Shanza said, it, well, he talked about collaboration, co-creativity and contribution. Collaboration, co-creativity and contribution. And if you look through that, that workbook, if I was looking at the Twitter feed, of the, uh, the takeaways from yesterday, if you listen to the conversations just this morning, Shireen's and then Timon's, networks, collaboration, uh, the ability to connect with people lies at the heart of it. The last presentation I delivered in person was uh, at a big event was in January of last year. And it was the Association of Event Organizers. And the opening speaker was the COO for IMEX. If you've never come across IMEX before, IMEX run two of the biggest expos in the world. And they're all for the meeting industry. They meet in Las Vegas, where I think they have about 20,000 delegates, uh, and in Frankfurt, where they have about 15,000. And their COO, Nalan Emre, stood on stage, opened the conference, talking about the work IMEX had done to make those events as sustainable as possible. That was their goal. And this was the journey they took to building that sustainability. And Nalan talked about everyone involved in the process. She talked about the teams at IMEX, all the different teams, not just the, the staff uh, as a whole, but every different team had different agendas and they all needed to get on board. She talked about getting the suppliers on board, the people that built uh, the exhibition stands, the people that provided the catering, the transportation companies, the companies that pick people up from the airport. All of these people had to get on board. The exhibitors had to get them on board. The delegates had to get on board. In order for them to be able to achieve their sustainability goals, they couldn't just rely on setting a target and working towards it. They had to get everyone on board. And what Nalan said that really struck me during that presentation was this. Once stakeholders join in, your activity gets multiplied. Once stakeholders join in, your activity gets multiplied. Whatever you're looking to achieve in your career, whatever you're looking to achieve in your role, once your stakeholders join in, your activity gets multiplied. In other words, the better the relationships you have, the stronger, the deeper the relationships you have, the more ability you have to tap into those relationships and seek support when you need it, then the easier it is going to be to achieve your objectives and to achieve your full potential. And that's what this session is all about, Help, all about helping you to tap into that network to achieve the best you possibly can in your career and in your role. And I should say, just on that point, that when I talk about having a network that can support you, if you're only focused on what that network can do for you, your network will shrink. So while I'm going to speak um, about how your network can support you, you have to be thinking the other way. Katrin has said that her screen's gone blank. If your screen has gone blank as well, can you just type that in the chat so we can isolate if that's a general issue or whether it's just local to Katrin's uh, computer? No, so Katrin, that seems to be an issue uh, for you. Unfortunately, I can't do much about that, but your network should be able to help you with some advice, I would hope. But back to this point. Uh, 
we we need to understand that we're looking out for others as much as they're looking out for us. And my favourite quote um, in in terms of networking comes from Elizabeth Asquith Bibesco, who was the daughter of the former British Prime Minister, Lord Asquith. She was an author and a poet, and she said this, blessed are they who give without remembering and receive without forgetting. Give without remembering, receive without forgetting. And I want you to hold on to that philosophy as I go through how you can build a network that will support you in your career and in your role so that you can understand both sides of the equation. Is that OK with everyone? Just tell me in chat that that makes sense to you and you're really happy that uh, you're going to be looking out for others as much as they're looking out for you. Great. Thank you. Uh, and yes, I love it as well. That's that's absolutely my favorite quote. So here's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at the power of strong relationships to help you in your career. The importance for you to build a network of individuals who are in a position to help and support you. Strong relationships with those individuals that they want to help you. And a clarity of message and a willingness to ask so that people are able to help you. What we're going to do to do that is look at three areas. We're going to look at how you build effective relationships and the mindset you take into it. We're going to look at how you nurture those relationships so you've got the strongest possible connections. And we're going to look at how you leverage them as well. Yes, I'm going to go there. That dirty word, how we leverage relationships, because what's the point of building a network if you don't ask for that support? So as it says there, people are able to help you. As we do this, I'm going to be uh, asking for your opinion as well. So if you have got a mobile phone handy or a tablet, now is the time to get that out. Because in a moment, I'm going to ask you the first of three questions. And we're going to use an external polling function that I can share the results on the screen with you. And we can share all of the results to everyone afterwards. So if you have that mobile phone or tablet handy, if you've got a, um, a QR reader on it, open that QR reader now. Otherwise, open a browser and you'll just either scan the QR code on the screen or you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and then the code you can see on screen, 24267079. If someone could do me a favor and just type that into the chat as well, because I'll come off this screen in a moment, uh, and not everyone can always read that easily. Uh, it's menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and the code is 24267079. Thank you very much. I can see a few people have done that. When you go into that, and I can see some of you have done that already, you will see a poll which has a question, and the question is, how strategic are you in developing professional relationships with three statements, which you will rate whether you uh, feel strongly about it one way or the other. I know exactly who I need to meet and develop relationships with. I have strong relationships in every group who could help me meet my objectives. And I'm very focused on what I can get out of a relationship. I'm just going to give you a few moments. I can see uh, over 20 of you have completed that already. So that's over. We're, we're over halfway through the groups. So that's great. So I'll give that a few seconds uh, just to give everyone a chance to complete that. Okay, as we can see, and we're pretty much on, 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 on most people in the room have completed that now. Please carry on uh, if you haven't had a chance yet. Um, Pretty much as I would expect, you know, obviously I do this with a lot of groups and I've started to see where where most groups are. I would say that in terms of knowing who you need to meet and develop relationships with, that's a reasonably healthy score, uh, 5.6 as an average. Um, but obviously there's room for improvement there, more focus about how you uh, develop the right relationships. Do you have strong relationships in every group that could help you meet your objectives? We're on a five. So again, there's plenty of room for development. Being focused on what you can get out of a relationship, uh, you're, you're probably lower than the average group, which might um, represent the public um the, the public service philosophy that many of you will obviously be very familiar with and, and will be embedded in your work. Um, but here's the thing, and, and we will talk about this, but if you, if you are not willing to ask people for help, if you're not able and comfortable leveraging your networks, you cannot achieve the same level of success. That goes back to uh, that those comments I read out 
from from the delegate workbook uh, you cannot achieve the best you can possibly achieve in isolation so you will be serving others if you ask other people to help you and and i know that's an area of discomfort for many people but it's really key that we can we can understand that and hold on to it but i will come to that and i will address what makes you uncomfortable asking for help and what what means you're holding back because i want to see that 4.8 become a much higher score after this session so let's start by looking uh, at building your professional relationships and and what we're looking to achieve here now first thing i want to say here is that we have to find a balance a couple of years ago, I went to a presentation by a guy called Luca Signoretti. Luca is an Italian leadership strategist. He's now a regular guest on my podcast. We had connected at that point um, a few months earlier. Uh, he's based in Monaco. Uh, and we had recognized we both talk about similar topics. And uh, there were opportunities to collaborate, which, as I've explained, we're now doing. And... Uh, Luca was giving a presentation in London, so he invited me along, and it was on networking. And at the end of the presentation, I, I, or a few days later, I said, Luca, I can agree with 90% of what you talked about, but I'm stuck on one thing. And he said, what's the one thing? I said, well, everything you said to that group when you talk about networking skills was about what can that person do to help me? How is that person relevant to me? My approach to, to networking is building relationships. And you build a strong network of people so that you have uh, access to the help you need when you need it, not necessarily in that first moment. And Lucas said, I agree with you. I said, I took that approach with that group for a particular reason, because I want them to have what he termed a partnership mindset. A partnership or a strategic mindset um, is what we both believe in. And is that is understanding, you know, you've, you've all heard the phrase how to work a room. There's no point knowing how to work a room if you don't know why you're in the room in the first place. And you need to understand how this fits in with your objectives and the support you're looking for. So Luca and I debated this and we both eventually came to an agreement that you have at one extreme the partnership mindset uh, that Luca was talking about. A good example of this is uh, financial advisors will have paid intermediaries. They pay people for introductions. The relationship is all about the transaction. And at the other extreme, you have the relationship mindset where you become personal friends, which is lovely and great. But if you're only focused on that, it's wonderful for your your social life. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to succeed in your professional life. And somewhere in the middle lies a blended mindset. And that's what we ideally need to be looking for. So I am going to talk about strategic mindsets. I'm going to touch on it, but I think we need to understand how it lies. You need to understand who can help you. You need to understand who can support you in what you're trying to achieve. I don't know if Marie Evans is on, on this session, but I noticed a, com a comment from Marie Evans in the chat from the previous session. And, and she said, being remote from the office means that you lose uh, being able to observe and build relationships with people you can learn from. So one of the key things that we're looking to achieve uh, thank you, Marie. Great. And thank you for that comment, because it goes straight to this point. We need mentors, but we need to understand who who can mentor us, who can support us in that role. When we're looking at um, uh, uh, trying to build cross uh, agency collaboration, we need to know who different stakeholders are in the process so that when we are trying to achieve an objective, we understand who has influence, we understand who's implementing an idea, we understand who can give the, us the information, the ideas, the insight that we need, we understand who can make introductions. All of this is in Connected Leadership, which is the book uh, that Shireen mentioned uh, before the break that you all have access to, and I know some of you have, have started reading already. Look out for the relationship matrix in there, and it will show you how you can map out your stakeholder groups, work out how, who you need to build strong relationships with, and focus on them. And that's all fine. But if we just have this tunnel vision on building relationships, that's when those networks start shrinking and it's where we miss opportunities. You might all remember this type of scenario, the conferences and events that we used to go to physically. I, I, I was so looking forward last year. This, this session was meant to be last summer. 
uh, and coming to join you in person. And I hope that I get to come back and meet you all in person at the winter school or next year's summer school or whenever it, it might be. But you'll all recognize this scenario when you go to events like that. And we have the elevator pitch and, uh, uh, you know, the exchange of business cards and so forth. And they can be great. They're, they are an integral part of the process of building relationships. But if we're too transaction minded when we go there, we run into problems. A number of years ago, I went uh, along to such an event. It's called Soccer X. Uh, and, and a client asked me to go along uh, to support their team that, who, who were attending the conference. And Soccer X, as the name suggests, is the global expo for the football industry. I can't call it soccer. Um, but it's the global expo for the football industry. So all the suppliers to the football industry go there and all the, the clubs go there. So all the leading clubs in the world attend Soccer X. So you see Bayern Munich representatives there, Barcelona are there, Real Madrid, Manchester United, Charlton Athletic. All the top clubs in the world are represented at Soccer X. And you see an extreme of the, of the activity you see at so many events. Everyone's given a name badge. You know, laminated name badge like this that you've all seen that they hang around their neck and walk around with their name badge around their neck. And everyone makes what I call eye to badge contact, staring at each other's navels, because that's where the information they want lies. Are you relevant to me or not? And I met a guy in. Yes, Matt, I am. <laughs> uh, I met a guy in. Um, in the networking area who came from Germany and I established quite quickly uh, that he was looking to meet commercial directors of Premier League football clubs. And I had to find that out quickly because our conversation lasted 45 seconds because within 45 seconds, he worked out I wasn't the commercial director of a Premier League football club. And he said, would you excuse me, Andy? There's someone over there I have to talk to. And he walked a few yards and got on his phone. If he'd spent just a few more minutes getting to know me, he might have found out something about me. He might, in fact, have found out that I knew other people there, including a long term friend of mine whose job at the time was the commercial director of a Premier League football club. If we're too focused on this and not enough on this, we're going to miss opportunities. Shikala, I know I'm sure most people have experienced this. And I say to a lot of people, if you work for a well-known organization, attend the same event twice, once with your job title and organization on your name badge, and the next time with Shikala Mansfield Limited on it, and see how people treat you differently when you go along. And we miss opportunities when we do that. We need to take these name badges off and get to know the person. Make eye-to-eye -eye contact, not eye to badge contact. Henry Kissinger was the, the, the uh, US Secretary of State um, and uh, uh, foreign policy advisor to Richard Nixon and, and several other presidents. Many of you will know Richard Nixon. Oh, sorry, will know Henry Kissinger. And, and Hen Henry Kissinger um, really came to the fore in about 1958. Uh, and he was starting to, he was being selected for professorship at Harvard. He was being invited to the White House to start advising presidents and, and advisors there. And he had a mentor called Fritz Hamer. And he met Fritz, Hamer, uh, Fritz Kramer. He met Fritz Kramer in the army in 1944, I think. And immediately he became uh, he, uh, uh, Kissinger's key mentor. And Fritz Kramer, around 1958, said this to, to Kissinger. He, he wrote this in a letter. He said, you're beginning to behave in a way that is no longer human. And people who admire you are starting to regard you as cool, perhaps even cold. You see too many important and not enough real people. Too many important, not enough real people. If we are too transactional in our focus, people see through that. That's why I say your network shrinks. Your reputation goes the wrong way. You do need that strategic mindset. You do need what you want to achieve. You need to know what you want to achieve and you need to know who's going to help you get there. But you do that by building the relationships along the way.
Kim, I can see there's quite a long question there. If, there, if it's an actual question, can you pop it in the Q&A for me um, so that then I make sure I don't miss it uh, at, at the end uh, of the session? Um, I can see there are, we have some issues with technology. That's a different type of networking. Um, but thank you for all the comments so, for, so far. I can see that a lot of this is resonating. Uh, and, and Andrew, um, you will be able to access the recording of this to, to access what, what you've missed so far. So let's flip from that, uh, that strategic mindset and look at the relationship mindset. And I want to introduce you to my friend Kelly and a suitably cheesy photo. I think this is one of the cheesiest photos of me in existence, but we'll go with it. Um, Kelly's become one of my best friends and I met her at a networking event. In fact, it was a Christmas dinner, probably about 15, 16 years ago. And in fact, I'm, Kelly starts maternity leave on Monday and I'm seeing her for lunch. Uh, for her first day of maternity leave. We, we're, we're very close friends now, but we met at a networking event. And it was the friendship that drove it. It was what we shared in common rather than what our businesses did. Interestingly, we have both been clients of each other at different times. Kelly's design agency designed my website. They've designed most of my materials. Uh, they're behind a lot of, uh, uh, of the things that you'll see if you engage with, with me in any form. Uh, and I've worked with Kelly and her, her business partner on referral strategy. I've also been uh, uh, I've also interviewed Kelly for my most recent book, Just Ask, because she's had a, a horrific journey with uh, failed IVF, with miscarriage, with stillbirth. You know, everything's crossed for next month or a couple of weeks time. Um, and she's been very public about it. And her business partner wasn't keen on that. So I talked to them both about how they manage that, th those different outlooks. So Kelly and I have been very close. It's been driven by our friendship. We've been clients of each other, but most importantly, we've been there for each other. We've referred each other countless times. My biggest client uh, comes from a referral from Kelly and it came to a personal friend of hers. Uh, I've, I've helped her with her public speaking and I've supported her at events at which she's spoken. We've been there for each other, but it's all come from a relationship that built from things in common. So here's my point. You can have the strategic uh, approach, but you can be too strategic, but you do need to know who you need to meet. But equally, if you meet someone and you just get on, don't worry about it. If you have rapport, if you have things in common, build that relationship as well. And you never know where it might lead. At the very worst, you'll have a friend for life. And that's something really to look forward to, isn't it? So practical stuff just to finish off this session. How do you build professional relationships? This is really difficult at the moment. It's going to get easier as you can meet people in person. But number one, through introduction, get people who trust you and trust the person you want to meet to make an introduction for you. I hardly ever approach anyone cold. If people are introduced, then they are already warm to you. So understand who you need to meet and then say, who do I need? Who do I know who knows them? Use LinkedIn as a way to do your research. Find out who people are connected to. If you search someone you need to meet on LinkedIn, you can see if they're a second degree connection. If they're a second degree connection, that means you share people in common. Can you pick up the phone to those people and ask them for the intro? Go online. I've just touched on LinkedIn. Use LinkedIn as well to uh, engage with people in threads on, on posts of people in your network. And if you have an engaging conversation, connect with them through that. You can look at who LinkedIn throws up, you might know, but don't just click, click, click. It's not about click, connect, click, connect, click, connect. It's about conversation, not connection. So look for real reasons to connect. Look for what you have in common and bring that out in your connection request follow hashtags on twitter i'm following the the hashtag for the summer school uh this week and, and it's been really interesting to see what's been said there are opportunities to connect through there as well so online is a great way i i don't think many organizations have quite yet mastered the online networking element and it'll be interesting to see how it works on on hopping i've seen it work on hopping before for me I find that when you have a large number of people on a call, the extroverts will hog the conversation. So if you are involved in, in putting on events with more than six or seven people, think about using breakout rooms. Think about putting people into smaller groups so that everyone can involve, engage in the conversation and you get more meaningful connection through it.
And yes, events will come back. And I've seen some of you say that you are uncomfortable with events, that you dread them. And yes, they're, they're, they, they can be awkward, but they're awkward when people are too, too transactionally minded. They can be a pleasure when people are just going there to seek interesting people, find interesting conversation and build relationships. Understand what you want to achieve before you go to the event. Park that in the back of your mind so that if you meet the right person, you'll know but then just go to meet interesting people. And that way you'll build your network in a way that you can be comfortable with, you can engage with, and, and you can enjoy going forward. So that's building your professional relationships. I want to um, move on now to nurturing them. Before we go to our second poll, uh, I want to share something with you. I think that we get the term networking wrong. And I think our understanding of networks is flawed. And I think we see networks as binary. You're in my network or you're out of my network. And there, I get asked all the time, how many people do you think you can have in a, on average in a network? There are studies on this. There's the Dunbar law that says 250. There's Girard's, uh, uh, sorry, the Dunbar number that says 250. The Girard's law that says 150. They are flawed. And, and, and they're flawed for many reasons I won't go into now. But one of them is that they're seen as binary. You're in my network, part of the 250, or you're out of my network. Networks don't look like that. I believe networks look like this. There are seven stages to professional uh, relationships, or I've identified seven stages, because obviously there are a lot more if you drill down into the nuance of it. But when you meet someone, first of all, and by the way, if you can't see the slides clearly, I will make them available with the poll results after the session. I'll try to do that by this afternoon. But so I'll read those out just in case you can't see it clearly. Stage one, when someone first comes into your network, you'll recognize each other. So if we let's say we meet at a conference or event, we have a conversation. If we bump into each other a few weeks later, we'll recognize each other. But how long does that recognition last? How long is it before you meet again and you go into the, you know, the same introductions you did before? So we need to move people on. We need to build a wall behind us. And, and the, the number one tip I can give, this, give to you for this is 24, 7, 30. Follow up with people within 24 hours of meeting them. Some people say, isn't that a bit desperate? And I say, well, it's not dating. You're looking to build a relationship. You're looking to look reliable, look interested in them. Follow up within 24 hours and not chapter and verse of what you do and what you have to offer. A two-liner to say it was great to meet you yesterday and maybe reiterate something in your conversation and if there's a next step, talk about that. Follow up again after seven days. I use the seven-day mark to send a personalized LinkedIn connection request, a personalized LinkedIn connection request. I don't just click connect and send it blank. If I'm on the desktop site, click connect, add a note. If you're on your mobile app, uh, click on the three dots next to connect or click, or it might say more, and then personalize uh, invitation or connection requests. Always personalize it. It was great to meet you last week, shall we connect here? And then a month or 30, after 30 days, so three weeks later, you'll follow up again, uh, ideally, in, a, in an ideal world, would meet face to face for a coffee, but you might have a virtual coffee, send them some information that might be of interest to them, whatever it might be. But if you can achieve those three two way touch points in the first 30 days of meeting someone, you've built a wall around that first uh, level of relationship and they stay in your network. Again, Nikki, um, if I can come to your question at the end, that will be great. But could you just copy and paste it into Q&A for me so I make sure that I don't miss it? That will be that will be really helpful. We move from recognized to when we know people, then we look to build uh, a rapport with them. So we like each other and trust each other. You could probably throw respect in there as well. But we know like and trust was coined by an author called Bob Berg in a book, Endless Referrals, and it's very well recognized now. So these are the first four stages. We recognize people, know them, like them, trust them. Now we get to the bit where the magic really happens for me. We have supporters and we're happy to support them. We support each other. And then the step beyond that is we advocate for, for each other. The difference between the two for me, for a supporter is someone you can pick up the phone and say, would you help me? And they would be happy to. 
An advocate is someone where you don't need to pick up the phone. They're doing it anyway. If they're in front of someone right now while you're on this this call, they're talking about you because they recognize that opportunity and they want to champion you. So that's how I see the seven steps. Let's um, find out where you see yourself there. So if you can go back to the poll, which hopefully you still have uh, open, and we'll move on to the second question. And I will, I'll show you the question, then I'm going to put the slides back on screen so you can see the one to seven again. But how deep are your professional relationships? So what level of relationship do you think is ideal as an average for your professional relationships on that one to seven scale from recognize? Uh, and I didn't say, by the way, seven is friend. They move into your personal network. So support was five, advocate was six. And what do you think your current average level is? So what do you think is an ideal and where do you think you currently stand? I'm going to put that slide back up for you just to help you as you answer the question. Nikki, while people answer, I'm going to answer your question now. Um, the, the, the poll should show on your phone, Lynette, or on your tablet, and I'll bring it back on screen in a moment. If you haven't been there before, if you go to... Um, there we are. Uh, scan that QR code or go to menti.com and type in 24267079. I can see we've got quite a lot of problem, uh, quite a lot of responses. So um, if it's OK for time, um, we'll go with the ones that we've got. And you can you, you can obviously that will, will, will help moving forward. Uh, I did say, Nikki, I will. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick answer to your question, and I can see that uh, Mark has done so as well. My quick answer is this. Write down a list of the five reasons why your your colleagues or your clients value you. What do you bring to the table in your role? Then write down a list of five things that make you a great date, within reason, of course, but great dinner company. Then look at those two lists. With the first five, what, why people value you, why wouldn't people want to talk to you at an event? Why would you have nothing to offer? And the second list, what makes you great uh, company, why wouldn't they enjoy a conversation with you? Focus on that. Be outwardly focused. Take yourself out of the equation in conversation. And when opportunities to help people come up, you'll spot them. It's about the willingness to do so. So that's a quick answer to that question. I hope that that helps, Nikki. Here's what we said in the poll. And again, you're pretty much on spot with other sessions that I run. Five to five point five is the, the normal range for the ideal level of relationship. That's between supporter and advocate. Five point three. You're right in the midpoint of that. Where do you think your current average level is? Four point two. Again, that normally ranges between three um three and uh, four, I would say. So you're pretty much um, spot on with that. So we will come back shortly um, to some, some things that you can think about in terms of improving those numbers. But it recognises that, yes, there, there's work uh, that, that can be done here. Why is this important? Let me introduce you to Tim. Because many people just think, well, why can't we just have a professional relationship with people in our professional network and that's it? So actually, level four, trust is fine for me. This is Tim. I met Tim when he was the managing director of one of the biggest private equity banks in the UK. And I was running a, uh, uh, delivering a presentation at a retreat for their senior management team. And Tim and I, after my presentation, I stayed for dinner and Tim and I sat next to each other over dinner. And over that conversation, we, we struck it off. We got on really well. And as a result, Tim invited me to work with his team. I don't think it would be underplaying it to tell you that that program I ran with Tim's team was the biggest disaster of any program I have ever run in my career. It was a complete car crash. So I slunk away from it, kept the relationship with Tim. And about three years later, we were having lunch together. And he said, Andy, why do you not um, work with us anymore? And I said, Tim, do you not remember how that worked out last time? He said, yeah, I suppose you're right. But why did that happen? And we looked at it in detail and we identified the reasons for, for, for the problems. And, the, and they weren't down to the content or the delivery. It was how we set it up and who we invited on but we'd never done that analysis at the time. 
So Tim brought me back in to work with a new team there and everything went really well. And Tim, not only that, but Tim has now referred me on a number of occasions and he's my mentor. So we've gone from the biggest disaster possible in my career to this man referring me regularly to his clients and being my mentor. Why do I think that happened? There are a number of reasons, but here's number one, the main reason for me. When Tim and I chatted over that dinner, we talked about my presentation. We talked about his team, but we didn't spend much time on that. Most of the time we talked about football, funnily enough, because we're both big football fans. Uh, Tim's an Aston Villa fan and he owns a number of Club Wembley seats at Wembley Stadium. And Villa were playing Chelsea in the uh, FA Cup semi-final a couple of weeks later. And Tim said, do you want to come to the, uh, to the semi-final? I said, I'd love to. He said, meet us in the Chinese restaurant on Wembley Way at two o'clock. I went into that restaurant looking for this city banker in a pinstripe suit and I couldn't find him. Instead, I found this guy. Tim and I connected on a personal level and he let that personal level shine through. I know for many people, particularly in public service, that's difficult to do. I started out my career in the civil service, but you can still let your personality come through. Angela's already said she loves Tim straight away. Does the, did this do that for you, Angela, or did that do it for you? The personality coming through and whatever your role and whatever the constraints on your role, you can let your personality shine through. And when you let your personality shine through, you build relationships. I want to give you six key tips on building those relationships, deepening that connection so that you can really get people to that level six, that level seven. Tim has become a personal friend to me now. So let me give you those, those six. And the first one, commonality and vulnerability is at the core of that story. We found what we shared in common. If you don't like football, you probably didn't get that story. And that's absolutely fine. But where you do share something in common, then you build on that and you find that that latch. And that vulnerability is about letting a bit of the mask slip and letting people see the real you. My last book and one of my key talks was about vulnerability. It was about asking for help, letting people see that you need that support. And in so many of the interviews I conducted, it was so clear the power that that has. Then we have the eye test. Look at any communication you write to any, any person, that, that email that you send after you meet someone and count how many eyes are in that compared to how many you's. How many, how many times do you say, I think this, I do that? I had a LinkedIn connection request from someone. I went back to her and said, why would you like to connect? In her response, there were 16 eyes. I do this. I specialize that. I'm trying to achieve this. I'm interested in that. There were no yous. No indication that I could be anyone apart from anyone else. She hadn't looked at my profile. There was, it was just collecting numbers because it was all about her. So look at all of your communication, look at all of your conversation and see how many times you say I compared to how many times you say you. Have no agenda. This is about making it about the other person, not about you. Take it out of the equation. Take yourself out of the equation. Reach out to people when you don't need something. Reach out just to say, how are you doing? How are you coping with the pandemic? How's work at the moment? But never with anything for yourself. Not when I say never, make that 90%, 80%, 90% of your connection. Make it about the other per the person, about the other person, not about you. Exceed expectations is a very simple one. If you do more than people expect, they will be drawn to you. But you've got to manage when you do that. You know, the old, the old classic line, under promise and over deliver. Do that when it's important to other people. And you can only do that when you know that it's important to other people. Be consistent and frequent in when you engage. It's not about having one great meeting for an hour after you meet someone for the first time and thinking that's it, job done, we've got a relationship. It's about building that relationship over a period of time with lots of touch points, lots of interaction, being consistent about it and finally play where they play. So if you don't like LinkedIn, but your key connections, your key stakeholders are on LinkedIn and they're active, play where they play. Same with Twitter. Same with conferences. Understand where you can meet them and where they will happily engage with you and you'll build the relationship with them.
So I hope this is all useful so far. We've looked at building the right um, relationships and understanding the different mindsets you can take into it, the partnership or the transactional mindset. And we've looked at nurturing those relationships, building them and deepening them so that you, you, you've got people that will help you when you need that help. So now we have to move on to leveraging them, that dirty word. And we need to understand how we can get the most. Uh, out of those relationships and get the support that we need. And this is possibly where some of you will struggle the most. So if you can go back to the poll, those of you who, who are able to see it, how do you feel when you need to ask for help from your network? Can you just share some words that spring to mind when when you, you think about asking for help? Embarrassed is the first one up on the list we will let a few more come through uncomfortable excited happy so we do have a balance there feel like an imposter apologetic stupid interesting one inferior nuisance hold on to nuisance because i'm going to come back to that one and come back to quite a lot of these i won't get it so you're assuming you won't get it before you even ask over needy vulnerable so okay so a lot of these words are the ones that I would expect and I would, uh, that, that I often see. All right. You know, so you can see from what we've got coming in at the moment, most of it is um, difficult. You've got weak in there as well. Um, but there's some positivity as well. So some people are really happy asking for help, but not everyone is comfortable doing it. I think there's three reasons why we struggle to ask for help. We don't want to be a burden. Needy was one of the words that, that came up on, 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 that, uh, on that word cloud. We don't want to be a burden to other, to other people. Well, well, let's look at this for a moment. Can you think, and can you put in chat, think of the last time you helped someone else, personally or professionally, and you knew it went well. How did that make you feel? Can you just type in chat, if you helped someone, and you knew it worked out well, how did it make you feel? Tom said, great, we've got really pleased, satisfied, great, empowered, amazing, proud, proud, satisfied and useful, good, good, happy, worthwhile, fulfilled, relevant, great, great, chuffed, I love the word chuffed, useful. No one has said, I felt they were a burden. Can you see a disconnect here? When we help others, and I'm talking about people you know and have a relationship with, when we help others, we feel great. We, get, we derive pleasure from that. And yet we don't ask them for their help because we're worried about being a burden. Aren't you being a bit selfish? Aren't you denying people the pleasure of giving you their help? As long as you make it easy for them to help you and as long as you feed back, then they would get pleasure, as you've just shown they'll get pleasure and give you support. So if you're not asking because you think you'll be needy, you think you'll be a burden, think how you feel when you help other people and just make sure you make it easy for other people. Secondly, we don't want to be seen as weak. And we saw someone, well, we saw quite a lot of examples in there. You know, someone said, um, I think someone said weak, someone said nuisance and, and, and so forth. Here's the problem here. We see vulnerability as a weakness. Vulnerability is not a weakness. Can I emphasize that? Vulnerability is not a weakness. Vulnerability is a strength. Vulnerability is a strength. It takes strength to say, I don't know. It takes strength to say, I need help. And when you get that help, when you get that support, you achieve what you're looking to achieve so much more easily, which makes you stronger. So can we dismiss this idea that being see, asking for help is, is a weakness? It, it depends how you phrase it. If you turn around and you say, I don't know what I'm doing in my job and I keep failing at everything. Um, can you recommend me for a promotion? <laughs> you might seem weak. But if you turn around and you say, I'm absolutely bossing it. I'm achieving great results and I want to take the next step. Will you help me? Does that seem weak to you? So a lot of it is in the phrasing as well. And then finally, and someone, uh, you know, said that in the word cloud, we assume we assume that people don't want to or aren't able to help us. It's not for you to assume. Let that other people decide. All you have to do is make it OK for people to say no. OK for them. And you communicate. It's OK. If you if you can't do this, that's absolutely fine. It won't affect our relationship. But make it OK for yourself as well, because we're too quick to see a refusal as a reflection on us. 
people can have a hundred reasons to say no and you could be bottom of that list they may be too busy genuinely they may not feel able to help you there may be many other reasons but you could be bottom of that list so don't assume just make it okay for people to say no so here's how you ask number one know the strength of the relationship understand would people feel that pleasure from helping you or if they only just met you and they need to trust you and like you first and a lot of that will differ based on their uh, their personality type i talked earlier about consistency and frequency of connection as you build the number of interactions all things being equal relationships will grow so the strength of the relationships gets bigger if you ask for help too early which is that first impact point towards the lower end of the graph you're going to damage your 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 chance of growing that relationship because they're not ready but when people really know like and trust you and you ask for their help and you make it easy for them to help you the relationship can accelerate so you need to understand the strength of the relationship when you ask or before you ask i've talked about this i've stressed this in the last few minutes make it easy for the other person to help you make it really simple for them you do the legwork don't say um can you introduce me to anyone who might be interesting to me but really hone in be bizarrely specific in the help that you ask for and show appreciation because that's when people will stop helping you when you take their help they hear from other people it's worked out well and you've denied them that pleasure of giving them your support. So I'm going to take a break for a few minutes before I wrap up the presentation, just to give you a few minutes to look at your questions. Before I do, a number of you uh, completed the professional relationships assessment uh, before uh, the session um, began. And, and I've seen them, been watching them come in to... Um, come into my inbox over the last few days some very late at night uh, and i can see from them that a number of people um i think many of you are in a good place but you can grow um your relationships i brought um gwen Lian, and i hope i pronounced that correctly gwen Lian. i brought gwen Lian on screen because gwen Lian was one of two people who scored over 80 percent um in that um in that assessment and i just thought it would be really interesting you, you've now heard me present the ideas um, that are behind that assessment, Gwen Lian. You've also seen the feedback to you in the assessment. Uh, it would be really interesting to know what stood out from you for the uh, from the assessment about what you're doing. What are you doing that gave you such a high score that other people can learn from? And what really resonated from, from this presentation that you think, yeah, that's something I do, or even that's something I can add to the mix to get me up to 90%. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm doing practical things because I'm going to be snag. Two things resonated with me um, in your uh, address today, and I think the word confidence matters a lot. Having the confidence of your employer or um, your institution to be in the room and to know why you're in that room. So I think that matters a lot in terms of creating and nurturing relationships um, and thinking about how you can assist others on their journey which might in the end end up helping you as well so I was thinking about a, a recent experience where I saw um, that an individual was publishing um, Welsh medium books um, based on equality diversity and inclusion and thought that there's something really interesting about the fact that she's out there um, and you know, can can I build a relationship with her because I think that she needs that help in order to be able to take her work forward, which also um, improves Welsh medium provision as far as equality, diversity, and inclusion in the early years is concerned. Because I work in childcare and in the early years, um, so it's recognizing um, why that relationship might matter, and I think. I, I like that the seven agreed with you that there might be more and how we over the last six months have worked our way up, the, up those um, state the, those seven different stages really. Um, and I didn't know her. So in that sense, I did cold call. I just sent her an email to say that I admired what she was doing. 
you know, would she be interested in having a conversation? And we just took it from there. Uh, it was as simple as that. Um, so it's having confidence. It's knowing that you having confidence in your ability as well to say, well, I've got something interesting that I think I can offer you and perhaps we can work together. Um, it's recognizing also your vulnerabilities. So the people that matter to me um, in terms of how they meant to me, uh, a, a, a collection of um, people who were within my um, institution and also external to the institution as well. And they give me confidence um, and they also recognize that I don't have to know everything. So I can turn to them for advice, for support, for help um, on almost anything. Um, and it's not being afraid of picking up the phone um, and not being afraid of, of saying, I really don't know how to deal with this. Um, so I think I could, acknowledging that you're vulnerable and that you have those weaknesses really matters in terms of um, testing the strength of that relationship. Um, and it doesn't have to be a pe about people who are senior to you either. It can be people who um, bring bring a certain energy or passion. Um, I've just appointed um, a new member of staff as an apprentice and she's amazing and she brings energy and she, she brings passion and she brings something completely different to the table. So it, it doesn't have to be about somebody who's older or more senior to you in, in, in terms of experience. Um, but I think that it does, you do, you do need confidence to say that, you do need confidence to say that I don't have all the answers because people might expect you as a leader to have all the answers. And it's taken time for me to recognize and realize that now that I've been in my role as a chief executive for seven years. Um, yeah, so thank That's you very great. much for the presentation. It was really useful and a lot of practical tips to take away as well. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Uh, just to pick up on a couple of things from there, you talked about being about the confidence, which is obviously key, and I've seen that come up in the chat. Um, you were also very purposeful, and I talked about being strategic, and you recognise someone, I want to connect to them. But where I think you went the right way with that connection is from the sound of it, you made the, the outreach about them more than about you. I think I'm really interested in what you're doing. That's the eye test I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, the, the, where people fail the eye test, they would say, I want to talk to you because I want to achieve this. You said you, what you're doing is inspiring. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as, you know, Dale Carnegie said, the sweetest sound to any man is the sound of his own name. And so being purposeful and reaching out to people makes a huge difference. So thank you very much uh, for sharing that, Gwen Leanne. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you can work out uh, actually, I'm just going to I can remove you now. So I hope you don't mind me doing that brutally. There are a lot of questions and I want to give them due time. So what I'm going to do is this. I can see a question from Angarad about a three minute opportunity in this afternoon's networking time. I'm going to answer that question for you, Angarad, now for the rest of them, because of the time, I'm going to answer them all for you on video. And I will upload that video to a website I'll share with you in a moment and that will be available ideally this afternoon but in the next day or so certainly um because i rather than rush everyone's question i'd rather give everyone a little bit more attention is, i hope that's okay with 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 you um Ankarad's question is any advice on maximizing the three minute opportunity uh in the in this afternoon's networking time so if you have a short period with someone else the number one thing that i would suggest is focus on them it goes back to the eye test ask interesting questions and listen to the answers actually listen to what they're saying this isn't about exchanging elevator pitches the worst question to ask someone at any networking event is what do you do now you're in a conference where everyone has something in common which is you're all in welsh public service so in that sense you can actually go somewhere with that question but it tends to be an icebreaker. And I think actually a much better approach, uh, I call what do you do, the, the, the networking equivalent is do you come of do you come here often? When in fact, the best question to ask is do you come here often? Not necessarily in those words, because that has other connotations, but what, what have you enjoyed about the event so far? So my way of making the most of those three minutes sessions is say, what have you taken away from the last two days? 
and then you're getting into a conversation about them not about you but one in which you are also able to participate so i hope that answers that question um and i hope that taking uh, a, a longer more um, considered res approach to responding to every question rather than just answering one or two in the time we've got um, works better for you. So that will be made available to you. Um, the book is already available to download. I don't have the link available for that, um, but but I know that you, you'll be able to get that from the, the Academy Wales team. Um, and, and, and the book, by the way, uh, to, just to say it is hopefully worth picking up. It was a, a, a finalist for the best short book uh, in the Business Book Awards this year. So um, hopefully there's a few nuggets in there that you can that you can enjoy. I just want to finish off, though, with these with these thoughts and um, with a link for you to follow for those further resources. This is where we started out. You need to build a network with people which gives you people who are in a position to help you. That's the building the professional relationships element of what we've talked about. People who want to help you. That's where you now nurture them, take them on that journey from you just recognize them to become supporters, advocates, even friends. And then people who are able to help you understand what's holding you back from asking for help and support. Hopefully I've covered that fairly comprehensively and then be willing to reach out and ask for their help. Do not assume that other people know when you need help. You need to reach out to them and do so. I see that Mark's put the link to um, uh, to the book in the chat. And you can also see uh, here, um, I will put the slides and the poll results from today's presentation uh, on uh, lapata.co.uk slash academy summer. And I will also add the video answering your questions to that as soon as I can uh, record that, which may be this afternoon, but I'm not making any promises. Having said under promise and over deliver, I'm now over promising. But let's see what happens. Uh, you can see on there as well, if you are podcast listeners, I see Tom's just uh, mentioned it. Uh, the Connected Leadership Podcast is what you want to search for, uh, for the podcast that I put out there. Uh, but you can get all the resource links from uh, lapata.co.uk academy summer and then navigate around it has been a pleasure to work with you i do hope we get the opportunity to do so again i look forward to answering your questions if you have any come back on the questions any sort of further uh, conversation you want if you have any further questions please feel free to reach out to me just mention that you were at this session and if you haven't taken the professional relationships assessment yet please do so. I see a number of you have subscribed to my newsletter um, already. The next edition is due out tomorrow. I have to start writing that. Um, so I hope you enjoy that and enjoy the rest of the summer school. Thank you very much.